welcome friends to this one day workshop on the living temple how many of you were present at the lecture last evening please raise your hands thank you how many of you were not present thank you how many are not sure <laughs> i just asked this question because there are so many things we seem to be unsure about all the time we are unsure who we are we are unsure where we are going we are unsure if this life has a purpose we are more unsure of things than sure of things life has come to such a pass that if we look at all the things before us of which we can be certain or uncertain there are more things of which we are uncertain than things of which we are certain it's a strange state of affairs that the forces of civilization have brought us to that instead of growth of certainty and knowledge it has led to more uncertainty and more ignorance about our own self and our future of course the question what is the purpose of our being here not in this workshop just being here just being here in life maybe just being here prior to life maybe just being here after the life that we can see here what is the whole purpose why are we here this is a question that we are not addressing for the first time we as the human race in recorded history have asked this question from the first day that any record is available of our history the vedas the oldest written texts still available to us in their original form speak of the need to know why we are here they speak of the means by which we can know why we are here they speak of the existence of a originating force a force that makes us be here called the nad the sound it's very strange that the rig veda thinks that the simplistic reason for being here is that there was a sound and the sound was permanent and therefore since the sound was permanent the sound had to be here and therefore we had to be here it looks very strange that a sound controls the whole thing sometimes one has a tendency to dismiss this old sanskrit text even the earlier pali versions one is inclined to dismiss them when they talk of a sound or a word or a something just a re resonance responsible for our being here but then we move on and move through different cultures and different societies and different races of human beings on this earth planet earth and we find they all went on asking the same questions and some who seemed to have the answers some who understood what the sound was declared categorically not in perhaps or maybes but with a sense of certainty that the sound was the reality that looks so strange that a word could be reality so when saint john spoke of the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god nothing more could be said about that word he did not say perhaps there was a word could be god <laughs> had he been to harvard he might have said that had he been to a modern university he would have said perhaps it is possible this is one of the uh, hypo hypothesis that we can consider that the word may be god he didn't say that he said the word is god the same thing that people in a different part of the globe with no communications with each other had said thousands of years earlier that the word was responsible for our being here that's such a strong statement it is so strong it is so positive that we cannot ignore it even though we have civilized ourselves even though we have civilized ourselves to the extent of being or do they call it in quotes objective we become objective we don't want to use subjective things we want to objectively look at reality having trained ourselves to be scientifically objective we want to know what is all this sound business we don't want to follow something blindly we must have proof unless we have proof we will not go any further people tell me 
you talk such big stuff, I am willing to go, but there must be proof. I said, if I don't give proof, will you not walk? They said, no way. I said, when you get up in the morning and you wake up, have you ever sought proof that you are awake? Or do you just get up and brush your teeth? Have you ever said, is there any proof that I woke up? If you have any, tell me. I have not been able to find any proof that when we wake up in the morning, we are awake. Why shouldn't it be? Why is the other possibility not real that we are still dreaming? That just the nature of the dream to shift in such a way that we think we are awake. Has any one of you ever had a dream in which you dreamt that you woke up? Anybody had that? So you understand what I am saying. When you dreamt that you woke up, you really thought you woke up. And you did the same things you would do when you wake up now. It was on the second awakening that you found out that the first awakening was a dream. There was no proof. You did not even wait for proof on the first awakening, which was a dream, positively proved later on. And you did not ask for proof on the second awakening. Is it possible that even when we think now we are awake, we are still sleeping and dreaming. One Chinese philosopher, Fa Zi, Fa Zi, he said he had a beautiful dream. He dreamt that he was a beautiful butterfly. He was flying in a garden and seeing beautiful flowers. And he flitted from flower to flower. And he enjoyed that flight till he woke up and found he was Fa Zi, the philosopher. And then it occurred to him. Am I sure that I am Fazi, the philosopher, who dreamt that he was a butterfly? Or am I the butterfly, now dreaming that I am Fazi, the philosopher? He could not find the answer throughout his life. There was no definite proof. Nobody has been able to give definite proof. When one is awake and when one is dream, every time you think you woke up, it looks like real and wake up. Every time you have an experience of shift and change in the level of consciousness, you feel you have woken up. Tell me, how many of you, when you wake up in the morning, even before you open your eyes, you're still lying in bed, you're just awake, know for certain that you are awake. How many of you are absolutely certain you are awake, even without opening your eyes and pinching yourself to see if you are awake? And every day you do that. Do you know why you are sure? Do you know why you are so sure? If you don't know, I'll tell you and tell, tell me, check it out and see if that is right. You are sure you woke up in the morning because the moment you wake up, you remember that you went to sleep. Is that right? Supposing you forgot to remember that you went to sleep, you'll never know you are awake. That's the secret. The secret of waking up is not to wake up. The secret of waking up is to remember that you slept. If you do not remember that you slept, if the eyes closed do not give you the feeling, this body is in the same bed in which I lay before I got my dream and unconscious state. If you do not have that feeling, you can never be sure that you are awake. But when you know you did go to sleep and you are back in the same state, the fact you are back in the same state is the only definite proof that you have and you don't seek anybody's proof. Supposing a friend of yours, a very trusted friend, Somebody whose word you will always believe comes up and says, Look, my dear friend, you are still sleeping and dreaming. And you say, don't be stupid, I know I'm awake. You will not even believe your most trusted friend if he challenges your state of wakefulness. Why? Because you have been able to link your experiential self, the self that has a life and a body and a moment by moment series of events of a wakeful life here, interrupted by sleep, interrupted by a night's rest, you have linked up that moment of recollection, a moment of memory, to the memory which you had before you went to sleep. That continuum gives you the feeling you are awake and you are real and this is the real world. We have no other proof. And we accept that proof as enough. If this proof is enough, that the fact we can recall we can recall that we were here and we did go to sleep and we come up back to the same stage in which we went to sleep. If this is the only proof that gives us a sense of certainty 
about being awake. Wouldn't it be a fair proposition to say that if we could awake further in this body, awake to a higher reality, awake to a further third awakening, awake to a reality where the moment we wake up, we can recall we were already awake in that state before we became a human being. Would that not be sufficient proof? Have you done it? Has anybody done it? Have you awoken to a higher level than what we are talking of at this level? This is the so-called wakeful state. Has anybody ever suddenly woken up to a state of being? You could recall, I was here for thousands of years. I was not here, just that body was a dream. I have a life much longer than that. I can recall events that happened 200 years ago and 1,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago. They happened to me. I remember them. If you can recall and be in the same state in which those events took place, would you need any more proof that there is a further wakeful state and this is only a state of dream, a higher kind of dream, a better kind of dream, a relatively more real dream than the one which we have during sleep? The only real proof we have that we are awake is that we can link it with another, another earlier experience of the same level of consciousness which relates to our own personal life, our own personal memory and our own personal recollection of a life prior to being in the human body. If one can get that, one has found all the answers. There are some people who do wake up like that and they discover that what we call the physical wakeful state is merely one level of dreaming in a series of levels of dreaming. They say just in the physical body at which we are now have, having a workshop, at which we are considering what is it to sleep, to dream and what is it to wake up. We are considering this. These experts who can switch wakeful states at will and they can go to sleep at will. Do you know some people are very good they sleep very little, a couple of hours, sometimes one hour, and they lead their life normally. And we wonder, how do they do it? Travel with them in the car. You'll see, as soon as they get into the car, they switch the sleep and they're off. When they're ready to get off, they switch it on and they're on, active as ever. We never know them. We think they must be tired. They can arrange their sleep at will. They don't need any tablets and pills, like we, many of us do, just to sleep. They have controlled the switch in their head by which they can sleep and wake when they like. Such people have also, under the guidance of those who are familiar with levels of consciousness and levels of wakefulness, practiced turning the switch on to higher wakeful states and discovering that this experience, which we call a truly physical reality, is nothing more than a dream. The question arises, if this is a dream, how is it being created? How come we have a certain lifestyle? We are born in a certain place. There's a continuum of events, a continuum of different relationships and scenes and shots coming before us, which are so consistently following one after the other, as if there is a real world and we can't change a thing. If it were dreamlike, at least we should say, let's have flowers here and they should be flowers. Let there be garden. Let's shift the workshop into a garden. We should all be able to do at will. If it is dreamlike, why is it so fixed? Why is it so unchangeable? Why is it so real? That's a big question. If it is dreamlike, why does it feel so real? And we cross check it again and again. I, I want this to be a dream cup, but it is too real. I can touch it and feel it. I can drink this water. Mmm, cool and nice and tasty. It feels so real. How can it be a dream? Every test I apply to this experience proves the reality. I touch it, I see it, I hear it, I feel it. All the senses confirm it is real. How come if so much confirmation is available for the persistence of reality in this wakeful state, how can I call it unreal or a dreamlike state? Go back to the dreams that we are sure of are dreams. At this stage, in this workshop, in the wakeful state, all of us are sure that at night when we go to sleep and have a dream, it is a dream. At least today, at this time in the morning, we can call it a dream because we remember it was a dream. During dreaming, we didn't remember. 
It's very rare. It's a rare lucky person who in a dream can say, I know it's a dream. It's a very lucky person. Any one of you have been lucky enough during a dream to say, I know it's a dream. Please raise your hand. Thank you. You're many lucky people sitting here. But otherwise, during a dream, we keep on saying, this is real. If somebody says, in a dream, this cup of water is not real, you say, come, you can touch it. And other people in the dream come and prove it is real. We forget the other people are also part of the dream. The proof that we seek, one sense perception confirming another, one part of the experience of a sense perception confirming the experience, that's the same fallacy. In a dream state, we try to get proof of the dream or reality by reference to other things in the same dream. How can we find the reality? The same mistake we are making when we are here. To test out if it is real or not, we are checking one sense perception against another in the same level of consciousness. We are asking people to come and give us proof of reality or unreality at the same level of consciousness. And therefore, we make the same mistake that we make in the dream. But like some of you are lucky, who can say in the dream and have felt it and experienced it in the known proven dream that they could say, I know it's a dream and wanted to wake up out of it. Are there any lucky people here who know that this workshop, this whole experience in the so-called physical wakeful state could be, perhaps is, cut out perhaps, definitely is a dream from which we can wake up? Is there anybody who's sure of that? I see very few hands. <laughs> there is no reason to have a different view. What's the difference? You will notice a very strange difference. There's a strange difference in this physical level of consciousness and the dream level of consciousness. In the physical level of consciousness, we seem to be making decisions. We decide what to do. In the dream sequence, it appeared it came in a rush. We, could, we didn't have time enough to make decisions. We just rushed through an experience. Have you ever noticed? In a dream, there is no time. We are forced to make decisions on a certain pattern. The pattern was set up when we were awake. When we were awake, we set up the pattern. There's my good friend sitting at the back. He's very strong, wearing dark glasses. He's dark in color, dark in glasses, heavy and hefty. <laughs> I'm not going to take the chance of hitting him back even if he hits me. If he hits me today, the best I can do is to go to sleep. In the dream, I'll hit him back. <laughs> That's my best chance. Now, when I dream of hitting him in a dream, when I dream of an experience of hitting him in a dream, it has not come from nowhere. It's not spontaneous. It is not causeless. It has a cause. The cause was set in the wakeful state and the effect was seen in the dream state. If that is so, it gives us a clue that if we could find out a means, a mechanics, of waking up to a higher state than the wakeful state, we would be able to know what was the cause that set into motion the effect that we call human life and human destiny. How are we situated here? Why are we born rich or poor? Why do we go through sickness in a different order? Why are we getting through things for which we are not responsible? When a blind child was taken before Jesus Christ and the master was asked, is this child blind because of his actions or the actions of his father? People were worried. What has the father to do with a child who is born blind? And why is a child born blind? What sin could he have committed that he should be born blind? Is it his actions, his karma or the karma of his father? Who is responsible for the child being born blind and being denied the valuable sight which human beings are entitled to? Who is responsible? As quoted in the Bible, the master answered, It is neither the child nor the father who are to blame. It is that the law may prevail. And people have never... I have quoted, asked people to interpret for me what law is being spoken of. That the law may prevail. What law? Have we ever gone into it and seen what law may prevail? Now, of course, East meets West is saying that was the law of karma. This is one of the most famous most famous happenings of this century that East and West 
the east and west have met at the point of karma they know what karma is karma was known only in the east now it is known more in the west in fact i the moment i entered the west in the beginning of my career in this country i saw a large cartoon a big yogi fat bellied yogi with a big pot serving what he called karma cola <laughs> so i knew the age of karma has arrived <laughs> what is karma karma is nothing but action and reaction whose action where did the action take place the law of karma as you study it in the east explains this phenomenon very clearly it says karma is not something that is happening in physical world karma never happens in the physical world there is no such thing as physical karma and here people have not understood it fully read the text karma is not a physical phenomenon at all karma is not a sensory phenomenon at all karma is entirely in the mind karma is a mental phenomenon karma takes place in the mind and is repaid back in the mind the seeds you sow are reaped not in this physical world but in the mind and that mental reaping of the seeds that you have sown are responsible for all that is happening in your sleep wakeful or wakeful states the karma the seed of karma the action that creates events for us in this life do not create events only in the physical world they create events in the dream world they cre create events in this wakeful physical world they create events for us in the astral world they create events for us in the causal mental world all based upon a single law of karma which remains mental all the time if the mind has no intention there can be no karma in fact all the legal jurisprudence of the world has based upon this law of karma manu the first lawgiver who took his hint and wrote down the codes of law who shall be punished made mens rea the intent behind the action the necessary ingredient for punishing a person that if a person hit somebody accidentally there is no offense if a person deliberately hit somebody it's an offense the need to put mental intention into the law books of the whole world of every country including the country where we are now having the workshop the need to put mens rea the mental intention behind an action to make one responsible for its fruits or for its punishment that law manu gave prior to the birth of christ and we are still following it and that code was based upon the law of karma the natural law which was operating whether you liked it or not which operates from birth you will be born blind if you are bound to be punished for an offense taking place in your mental action earlier there is no way out the mental law of karma is so re relentless it is so reckless it is so persistent you can do nothing about it you can try hard you can say i'll do good deeds to get back to the law of karma where whatever we are doing we are always invariably subject to its fruits <coughs> that law of karma is holding us in its way and we can get out of it our destinies are made our life is set up the events of life are set up and we go through it almost like prisoners in a in a trap prisoners being dragged from one event to another from birth to death that's what our life is like and what can we do about it and this is happening not to us it's happening to entire living create create creatures of this creation every plant every insect every animal mammal bird snake reptile human beings and those unseen things we call angels angels and fairies and gods and goddesses and all the lords of the higher regions all are subject to the same karma and they are all going through this experience because of their immense background of actions committed mentally in the past and where is this book held where you can record all the karma and there therefore you can decide what a person will do where is this record kept the record is not kept in this physical universe there is no mountain stone on which it has been engraved there is no wall on it which it can be read this record is not kept in the astral stage this record is kept in the purely total mental stage which we call the causal stage where we talk of the akashic records or the akashic records where the entire history of karma the entire history of actions is recorded 
and fortunately for us, through the process of awakening and further awakening can be seen by us while we are here. That's the kind of proof one should ask for. Not the proof of a little memory link up. The proof that this thing is operating in this form would be if one could go up to a level of awakening when one can see if this is true that all the events that happen in one's life, in somebody else's life, in total life as such is actually recorded on a mental plate from where you can see the beginnings of time and go to the end of time. This is the first time you will find there is a beginning of time and an end of time also. Right now we are so dense in our experience, we think time is infinite. There is no way, way for us in this level of consciousness, in this physical level of consciousness, there is no way to find out which is the end of infinity. No way, it's just a concept. The beginning and the end are a concept. What was before the beginning? Also time. What was after the end? Also time. There is no way we can end it. But the manner in which time is created and the whole series of events that lead to karma is actually being created and can be seen, can be seen if you are willing to step to a higher level of consciousness from the physical into the astral and step further from there into the causal and see how things have happened. The causal state is called causal because it is the cause of all that is happening right here. You want an explanation for why things are happening? Go to that level, you get an answer to all your questions. But how do we do that? How do we get this ultimate proof? Those who have the ability to awaken at will, those who have practiced a deep introspection, the ability to go deep into consciousness, go into the mechanics of consciousness, the mechanics of being aware, the mechanics of life itself, those who have gone into that have discovered that when you want to go from one level to another, there has to be something you can ride on from one level to another which should hold on your identity and yourself so that you begin to look at your own life, not somebody else's life to have proof. To see somebody else and say, this person is great, enlightened, he flies out of his body and has gone to the higher re regions has no value for the seeker who wants proof. The seeker will get proof if he can fly to the higher regions and see what it means to fly. Therefore, that link into a higher experience should be connected with the self, not connected with somebody else's external form. What is it that maintains a link of the self at different levels of consciousness? That link between one level of consciousness and another that keeps the self intact is called the word, is called the shabad, is called the nod, is called the, the sound, called the sound current, called the om, called the unending, unending voice, the unending sound, the unending re re reverberation, the unending resonance. You could give it any name. All these names have been given by different people and different cultures and different societies and different countries. They have all used these different words, each one representing something that is audible, something that can be heard. If you look at all these words I used, there's only one common quality in them. I am using words of something, some phenomenon that can be heard. If you can hear it, if you can listen to it, that's it. You can give any name to it. How does it establish that link between one level and another? Let me explain. Let's go back to the state to sleep at night and have a dream. Let us imagine that tonight we go to sleep and in the dream we actually dream that we are not human beings but little birds. I don't want to bring the fuzzy and butterfly back. I say let's birds, beautiful birds. And we flap our wings and we find the window open and we fly out of the window and have a beautiful experience and we come back and we wake up. And we wake up, we are back, Mr. and Miss and Mrs. So-and-so. We are back again in the same body, with the same name. And then we recall our dream and tell our friends, what a beautiful dream I had. I dreamt I was a bird and I, was, I flew out of the window. The friend can say, don't talk like that. Say you saw a bird flying out of a window. You said, no, I didn't see any bird flying out of a window. I flew out of a window. How can you fly? You have no wings, no feathers, nothing. How can you fly? No, but I dreamt that I flew out of the window. 
Now you have no resemblance in this body with the body of a bird. No resemblance whatsoever. How do you say it is you? What makes you persist in saying that was the same self when there was no resemblance at all between the two forms? The bird had a totally different form. You have a totally different form and yet you are absolutely certain it was you that flew in the window and not that you saw a bird flying in the window. You experienced the flying as if you were doing it. What's the link? Do you realize what the link is? The link is, it's the same self that makes you feel this is me. It was the same identical self that made you feel it was the bird. The self was the common factor. That self is called the word. That self persists at every level, whether we are in a dream or in the wakeful state or in a higher wakeful state, ultimately up to the level of the total creator who is one and the entire creation is taking place within that creator. It's the same self. The self never changes. When you discover that that self is the link between every level of experience, even to the level of the final single creator, then you discover that the self is the truth, is the reality. The self is not governed by the forms it takes. If in a higher state of being, you flew formless, you would still be the same self. And you could recall you were the same self who had a body, the same self who was a bird, the same self who is formless. But the consciousness of the self would be the same. What makes you persist in being the same self is a resonance, an experience of that self which never changes. Now, all the time we want to have experience of the self, we are looking at what is happening outside of the self. Look at the physical body. In this self, we want to see the cup of water. It's external to us. Even if we take ourselves as the physical body, this experience is outside of us. But when we have an imaginary cup of water, we are imagining inside there's a cup of water. Can you all imagine? How many of you can imagine there's a cup of water floating in this room? It's still outside of ourselves. It's not that this real uh, three-dimensional physical cup has to be outside. You look at all the experiences we are having, they are all taking place outside of ourselves. You can go into higher region, have an out-of-body experience, become like the clouds, become like a power and all you are seeing lights and sounds and regions and great worlds and great heavens and great mansions they are all outside of the self what is inside the self we are familiar with everything at every level of consciousness which is outside of the self is there something we can experience in the self is there something which we can begin to recognize if we forgot what the external manifestation the external truth is and get back to the inner truth and say, where is it manifesting from? Where is this world manifesting from? Where is the higher world manifesting from? Where are the heavens manifesting from? Where is that dimensionless self? Does it have any manifestation in an unmanifest form which we can recognize? When you pull your attention to yourself and not to any experience of the self, when you pull your entire attention to the self, the single focal point from which you can say, I am, I belong, I be, I am a being. I am experienced that I am being. If you go back, only pull your attention to that single thought, that single phenomenon that you exist in consciousness. When you pull your attention, you have an audible experience. The experience of hearing a sound. That experience is universal. It has happened to every human being who pulled the attention to himself or herself in every age, in every country, in every religion, in every society. There is no exception that I know of. If you know any, please let me know. If you find an exception that somebody pulled the entire attention to the inner self, which is consciousness, pure and simple, and did not hear the resonance of that sound emanating from the self within, not from outside, I'll stand corrected. It has never happened. Not only that, the sound in its dense form, that means when heard by us, when we are in lower dream levels, like the dream which we have at night, or the dream we are having now, the better dream, or still higher dreams of wakefulness in the astral and causal states, the self as heard in those dreams can be compared with sounds that we are familiar with. Not totally, 
but some similarities we can see. For example, when we withdraw our attention to the point that we are becoming unconscious of our body, at that time the self generates a sound which is not a consistent continuous sound but a sound with a vibration like a bell. Dong, dong. You see a big church bell? Heard that? Did it ever strike you? Why, why bells should be rung on churches? Why do they toll the bells on churches? Why? To call people? They said they call people by ringing the uh, bells on the church. Do they do the same thing in the temple? They ring bells? Do they do the same thing in other places of worship? Why create the same sound? And why in a temple? Why in a church? What's the significance? Well, the people who laid down these rituals as guides to us, because there were no printed books at that time, not even written books. The only thing was to give guidance in symbols, symbolic. They could make little symbols in Egypt, or they could make big symbols also in Egypt, or they could make little symbols in ancient India, in Sanskrit literature, in little forms, or they could make big symbols in the form of the big domes of the temples and the churches. Or they could watch the headgear that people were wearing and make steeples on the top of the churches or make different forms on top of the buildings to resemble what? Look at them again. Go back into history and go back into contemporary religion and see what is the shape of these buildings in which the bell is tolling, the shape of the head. This was always the symbol that the true temple where the bell rings is your own head. You can't see it, we'll make a big one for you to see. They make a big dome and we worship the dome and look at that dome with venerance and forget the real temple which we are carrying with us all the time. In every culture it happened that the real temple was known to be the human body, was known to be the top of the human body. The real sound, the sound not of a bell, the sound of consciousness, the sound of the self, the sound that created a link between any level of experience of the same self. That sound occurred in this dome, in this dome we all carry on top of our bodies. And all we have to do to get to know the self, to do self-realization is to enter the dome, enter the real living temple, enter the temple in which we can go at will at any time without having to walk. This is the only temple you can go to without riding a car, without walking. The only temple that is accessible to you 24 hours and the only temple that doesn't charge a fee or a donation. You walk in when you like. And this is the temple that we ignore and run everywhere else. What an irony of human destiny that the real temple which was a gateway to knowledge of the self was forgotten. And we went about looking for everything, a copy of it. Even the symbols looked more important, more venerable to us than the real temple. And history of mankind is filled with tragedy, tragedy of this knowledge. So much tragedy that when we made copies of this temple with our bricks and stone, that copy of our temple became more sacred to us. We were, if somebody scratched one of our copies, somebody removed a brick from one of our man-made temples, we were willing to destroy by the thousands the temple of God that God himself made. This is our history. This is how we treated the living temple of God. And all the same, all the time, saying, we know what is the real temple, this is a real temple, and we destroy as if our own temple was the only one that had the truth. The bricks and mortar did not create the truth. They don't survive. This temple that is born again and again, this temple that survives any number of generations after generations, this temple of the human form was the only living temple with the only living God that could be experienced within the temple by anybody irrespective of religion, irrespective of nationality. This is not tall talk of a philosopher. This is coming from those who experienced this. They spoke with certainty because they did not speak from hearsay. They did not speak from somebody, somebody else experimenting. They experienced because they themselves experienced. In the Sermon on the Mount, as you know, when Jesus finished giving his sermon, the Bible says, I have read the English version, American is more modernized. After he spake, instead of spoken, there was a hush upon the multitude. 
for he spake like one with authority and not like the scribes. Have you read that? What are the difference in his speech and the speeches of all the learned philosophers before him and after him? They were all learned in their works, in their books. He spoke with authority because he spoke from his experience. He spoke from what he saw and experienced within himself. The others were reciting what others had read from different sources. These masters who speak with authority do not speak because they have read about it or heard about it. They speak with authority because they have experienced it. They say with dogmatic truth that go in and find out if we are right or wrong. Don't waste your words and your logic on and finding out the possibilities here and there. Go in and find out. We are not sending you out somewhere. We are not telling you to convert yourself into another religion. We are not asking you to follow a cult. We are not asking you to follow a particular ritual. We are saying go in. Your own self. Stay in the same religion. Stay in the same nationality. Stay in the same body. Do what you are doing. Earn your living as you are doing. Be an honest person. And honestly go within and see if what you are saying is true or not. That's the kind of message these masters give. When the masters are around, we are so profoundly affected by their words. They speak with so much force of truth. We say, wow, that alone is the truth. And the masters go and die and somebody else comes. We keep on sticking to that. Masters are gone. We carry on their ghosts with us and say, no, we alone know it. Why? Because our master alone knew it. As if it is an exclusive property of a group. I have not known any perfect master ever giving a message for any particular group. Every message of every master who has experienced the truth has been for humanity as a whole, for everybody, irrespective of caste, color, creed, nationality. They never bothered about this. Their message is for the human being. That human beings, you are in a great state that you can find your own self. You can find the nature of the self. You can find out why you are here. You can find out if there's a purpose in being here. You can find out if this law of karma, the law which persists in bringing you here, keeping you here from birth to death. Why? Bringing you back again and again. Why? Is there a purpose? Is the purpose is an evolution of experience? Is it a learning process? Is it a process by which you can go back to your ultimate home? Then why did you leave it in the first place? Is there a feeling different in your own home if you have gone out and come back? Is that the purpose? Find out. Go within and find out. One could state them very simply, but these mystics and these masters don't say, accept anybody's word. So accept your own experience as the only proof that these are the true answers. So this whole experience built upon a knowledge that this body is the real living temple. This experience has been given to us by living masters. You can't go to a dead master and get this information. There's no way. Why not? For the simple reason that you have a mind that thinks doubts up, that creates and generates doubts ad infinitum. There is a mind, you cannot say it will create 10 doubts. The moment you have had 10, it will create the 11th. I want to see anybody's mind that stops having doubts. Never met one. The mind is a continuous machine creating doubts. How can you use that mind to give you knowledge and information? And when we say, no, I have an unseen master of the past. He was here thousands of years ago and he speaks to me in my head. Who is speaking in your head? I challenge you to prove it is not your own mind. Your own mind speaks to you in your head. There is nothing else that can speak inside except your mind. All the thoughts are the language of the mind. And we continue to fool ourselves by thinking that we can worship a bird, we can worship some spirit, we can worship somebody sitting in the Tibetan mountains. We have some white masters, yellow masters, all kinds of masters coming from different places, giving us messages in our head. And all the time the messages of our own mind. Who are we fooling? Nobody else but ourselves. Then how do we get out of this mess? Get hold of somebody who has experienced while you are there, that person has experienced a sense to a level of consciousness beyond yours. That's the only requirement. Meet a living master. Meet a living master who has 
while you are there with that master he has gone transcended this boundary and does not speak from other people's experience but from his own experience meet such a master be in the company of such a master and raise your consciousness so that when you go wrong and think you are getting voices he can hit you on the head and say this is not this is your own mind speaking go up further and find out the truth somebody should be able to hit us on the head and say don't fool yourself nobody will do it but a living master well the question arises if we can trust our mind and our mind is fooling us is it not unwise to trust the mind of another person we call master that's even worse how do we know that the master that we are consulting is not using his own mind and not only is he messed up he's messing us up also the answer is yes you can never know boy that's terrible then how do we find a master who does not use his mind but he uses his spirit he uses the process of realization that goes beyond the mind how are we how do we find such a master the answer unfortunately is you cannot find if you could find you don't need one if you could really recognize a human being who works not through his mind but works through his spiritual force of enlightenment if you could really see through it you don't need a master anymore and if you need a master you can't know who is that master you can have a lot of phony gurus you know the number of gurus is growing my own teacher the great master in india used to say there are perhaps more gurus than disciples in this world i am beginning to see the truth of what he said it's very easy to find a guru it's very difficult to find a disciple a true seeker is more rare than a phony guru in this world today so what do we do we like to believe that we need a master we believe we need a perfect living master we want to meet a human being who has that experience we want to meet somebody real and get the experience that we hear about that we talk about where do we find such a perfect living master and the answer comes from these perfect living masters themselves they say you cannot find such a perfect living master that is not to disappoint all of us and say that's the end of this workshop <laughs> that's the beginning of the workshop <laughs> these masters tell us another beautiful thing they draw our attention to the qualities of a perfect living master if a perfect living master exists and has reached the stages of awakening that i talked of earlier has reached seen the keshik records of all of us knows all of us very well if he is already knows who we are has known us not only from birth of this body but even prior to that has known our entire history and our future if such a person in a human form exists and knows us so well obviously it should not be necessary for us to shout for him and say come i am here it should be enough that we prepare ourselves in our own heart if such a ma master really exists in this world that master should be able to see us from inside not from outside if such a phenomenon does exist then instead of our finding a master it should be the job of the master to find us the old texts in sanskrit of the relationship of a master and a disciple say when the disciple is ready the master appears when the chela is ready the guru appears they have never said when you are ready go and find a master they never said that they have said when you are ready you will be found by the master thank god we have this phenomenon also taking place otherwise we would never have any contact with these perfect living masters but the fact we have a scope for being ready being seekers inside our own hearts the fact we can inside our own selves because of our own seeking say i seek you lord where are you hiding i can't see you every time i speak i am not sure is it my own mind the devil speaking or is it you speaking i am confused master master god come and help me you don't have to say it so loudly you can say it very quietly you can whisper you need not even whisper you can mentally whisper you can whisper in your heart in the privacy of a cave you don't have caves here in india they use caves you could use a closed closet or a bedroom or whatever walk in closet 
Just hang with the clothes. <laughs> Say, Master, where are you? Hide in a place nobody can see. And there whisper in your heart, I am missing you. Lord, are you real? Are you listening to me? Will you appear? If you can say that sincerely and have said it sincerely, you are ready. The master must find you. Otherwise, all my talk and workshop goes to waste. How can the master find you? He doesn't come to your closets and your bedrooms to find out where you are whispering to him. How does he find you? He finds you through a beautiful physical phenomenon called the process of coincidence. Anyone experienced a coincidence? <laughs> Let us see if you have all experienced coincidence. Have you experienced this great phenomenon that I have been watching around the world over several years that as our seeking grows in our own heart, unknown to anybody else, so do the number of coincidences grow in our own life. Anybody to vouch for that? Thank you. There are so many on common ground. These coincidences are not accidents. Who is creating them? Who can create a coincidence? We can't. We didn't design it. We didn't plan it. Who could make an improbable thing, improbable by the laws of probability, make it happen one after the other, as if it is something, an unseen hand playing that role? Who can do it? Not our mind. Not ourselves, obviously. Now, who is doing it? Is there anybody else than the creator who can do it? There is nobody else but the creator. If the master, the perfect living master, is one with the creator, his consciousness has reached the level of the creator. If he, such a thing has happened, if such a phenomenon exists, then such a coincidence must be the sign for us, must be an answer to our prayer in the heart. That's precisely what happened. I, I spent so much time around my own teacher, the great master in India. And I was amazed to find how people would come to him day after day, year after year, telling him how by strange coincidence they were going there and they saw a sign. They met a man in the corner who suddenly talked to them and they were thinking about it that morning and they turned around and ultimately ended up at the dera of the master. How by accident a book fell from the shelf they didn't have any intention to open it. They picked it up to put it back. And on the page, the first line gave an answer to a question they had the previous week. And they couldn't help wondering how it can happen. And they put the book back and traveled to the Dera to see the master. They could not help. I could not help wondering how this can happen. This did not happen to uh, local, uh, local hippies or freaks <laughs> of India. This happened to very respectable people before the hippie movement began. It happened to one American surgeon named Dr. Julian Johnson, who you can read his book. It's a published book, The Path of the Masters. Read his book, How He Found the Great Master, by strange series of coincidences. In fact, I want to know if anybody met the master without coincidences. I hardly knew anybody. I never knew anybody who was invited. Come, there is a master here and meet him. I know. In this society, we are used to calls being given on television, on telephones. You can pick up a phone, you're waiting for an important call, and it says, this is Reverend so-and-so seeking a $20 donation. <laughs> we are used to it here. But I have never seen this happen with a perfect living master. Never. That there was any call made except the call in the heart of the seeker. And by a series of coincidences, by unplanned programs coming up to a point when they felt here they were face to face with the master. It has happened again and again and again. Whenever we are ready, the master appears. In the true path towards self-realization, we need a living master who must find out when we are ready and our readiness depends upon the extent of our seeking within. There is no external ritual to be performed. There are no ceremonies to be performed. These masters, look at their teachings, look at their life. They have taken us out of these rituals. They have denounced these rituals which keep us outside. They have said, forget these things that keep you outside and entangled in this world. Come to the true self within your own self. The true kingdom is within. They have said again and again, each one of them has said the same thing over and over again. And yet the mind's tendency is to go quickly into a ritual. When we used to talk of the Dera, 
you heard the word dera yesterday you must have heard anybody who doesn't know the meaning of the word dera please raise your hands oh, so you all know there's a dera dera is the camp of a master there was a time i could watch people more interested in the dera than in the master mind is so much liable to vulnerable to these rituals that the moment you prescribe certain ceremonies and rituals the mind will go after it forgetting the truth which is not in these rituals at all the rituals and the myths associated with them they are there to hold us together till we can go within but we forget going within and think the ritual itself is the answer is the truth it has never been the truth these are all superstitions the masters don't come in to create new superstitions they don't want to say give up this superstition and pick up another one they don't say now you pray now you pray to the god in this hidden form and leave him there and for, uh, pray to him in another hidden form they don't talk like that they don't want to supplant one superstition for another they want to open your eyes and see for yourself what the truth is they don't want to have any blind faith at all the perfect living masters have never said have blind faith in the next life you'll be rich have blind faith after death you'll go to heaven they never have said this they have said open your eyes while we are here for a while we are here open your eyes while we are here after that you will not be able to open your eyes that's what they have said there was a great perfect living master in india named sheikh farid sheikh farid was a beautiful man and he his voice affected so many people like it happens with many people in their own families his own family did not see much in him they thought he was a crazy man particularly his son who said dad i like to believe all you say but you know i think i had to think about it a little more farid said son take advantage of my master qutbuddin he is alive get initiated from qutbuddin if he is dead you won't get anything and farid son said no dad qutbuddin is there i can go and talk to him sheikh qutbuddin was the master farid was a disciple at that time the son did not listen to the father and one day sheikh qutbuddin died when he died and they were lowering his body into the grave the son suddenly had remorse he said boy my dad was right i should not have missed this opportunity he ran to the grave and performed the ritual of shaving off his head and bowing on the dead body and saying Sheikh Qutbuddin I accept you as my master save me and his father was standing there he said my son there is no man for whom I have greater respect in this world than Sheikh Qutbuddin who has just been lowered in the grave there is no man for whom I would not do anything and yet I must tell you you are too late you missed the bus you not been initiated he is dead he did everything for me he has made me what I am you just missed it is gone you must now find the hand of a sheikh who is alive and can tell you son you are wrong this dead man will not tell you this is a eye opening story that he could not accept his own son getting initiated from a mystic who just died we need a living master who can tell us when we go wrong nobody tells us when we go wrong they all want to praise us they all want to get donations from us they all want to pray for us they all want to do something for us that we can't do and nobody is willing to tell us you are wrong you are going out go within the truth is only a perfect living master can really force us to go within our own selves not only force us to go within ourselves tell us how to go within ourselves tell us how we can find the self tell us how to overcome the difficulties as they arise if we find a road block during our meditation they can tell us what to do why how can they tell us because they know what they did they know how they were guided by a perfect living master that is why it's very important to remember this this is not a mental game this is not something that we can conjure up with our own minds and find solution this is practice of self realization and in that practice you need the assistance you need daily assistance you need assistance perhaps at the moment of the journey of a perfect living master who is himself or herself self realized
if somebody were to say, I want to have a good doctor, I want to get some medical treatment, but I won't go to any doctor except Hippocrates, the Greek physician. He's not going to get treated, I can tell you this. If somebody says, I like philosophy, but I don't like these teachers, I want to go to Socrates and attend his classes, he's not going to teach them anymore. And we assume that if ordinary education and ordinary medical treatment cannot be given by dead doctors and dead professors, that we can get our spiritual teaching and spiritual knowledge and self-realization from dead masters. It's not possible. This kind of a statement that I'm making bothers some people who say that the master, is the master just a physical form? Or is he more than that? I must answer that question right now before we proceed any further. The master is not the physical form at all. The master is the spirit. The master is the word. The master is the same sound that links us from consciousness to consciousness. The master is the higher form of our own self. The master is always within ourselves. The true master is always within ourselves. And why all this halabaloo about living master and finding perfect living beings outside? Because we do not know how to find the true master within. There was an Indian yogi who came to Chicago and spoke a long time back. And some of you may have heard his name, that Swami, Swami Vivekananda. Anybody heard his name? Swami Vivekananda. He spoke in the World Congress of Religions in Chicago. And while speaking there, he addressed his American audience. And he said in his concluding session, I have been telling you all these days that whatever you are seeing around you is maya, illusion, unreal. I have been telling you everything around you is unreal, illusion. How come I have been saying all this and then I have been telling you to listen to me? I am also around you. I must also be illusion. My words must also be illusion. How come on the one hand I am saying everything is unreal, that my words which I am giving to you, I am trying to convince you, they must also be unreal. They have to be unreal if everything is unreal. Then he answered this his own question. He said, that's true. I am as unreal as the rest of phenomena that you see. My words are as unreal as the rest of phenomena that you see. It's illusion. My appearance and talking to you is part of the illusion of phenomena. With one difference, the rest of the illusion draws your attention and you to it and holds you there. This illusion pushes you back into your own self and gives you realization. It's still the illusion giving you that help. Those words are very significant. When we, through coincidence in our life, come across a human being who we call a perfect living master, it is an illusion but one of the best illusions that could take place in our life. It's an illusion of our own consciousness operating at a higher level in a being that is illusion in a dream state. It's part of the dream. But that illusion pushes us back to our reality and wakes us up to our own higher self. Therefore, the true master is the spirit within which creates the illusion and goes outside. Sometimes people used to ask great masters, Master, if the master is inside, why do we have to look for one outside? He said, the real reason is <clears throat> we never look for a master inside. The master waits inside for us. Every human being from birth experiences a strange longing. A strange longing for truth. It is natural. Nobody teaches it. There's a strange loneliness that one is alone. This is not, this is not one's home, not one's company. A strange loneliness haunts us throughout our life. It's not created by anybody. It's natural. As we grow through this, we can find the answers to these strange happenings to us, these problems of loneliness and the problem of what is the truth, what is the reality. We can find the answers inside. And the answers wait there in the form of the spirit, in the form of the word, in the form of the creator, in the form of the perfect living master. The answers await inside us. And we never look inside. We go around spending all our life looking outside. Where are you, the truth? Where are you, the master? I am looking for you. And this truth and the master is sitting inside us all this while. What can the truth and master do if we are constantly looking in the wrong direction? 
He jumps out in the form of an illusion. Comes in our life. Says, here I am. You are ready. I am here. Now where do we go from there? Go back to where I was. Go back to your own self. And find that the truth and the true master is within. That is why it is the way we scatter our attention. The way we have made the external world created by the scattering of our attention as the only real world. That the master, the true master who is only inside appears in this world through coincidence and pushes us back to our own true self. That's the truth. And the master is the spirit. The same spirit. There is only one master. There always has been only one master. There are not so many masters. But there have been so many illusions. So many forms. So many experiences to bring us back to the only single true master. That is the word. The continuity of consciousness. The immortality of the spirit. That is the master. That has always been inside us. So this phenomenon of our having to deal with a human being as a master is a temporary phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that helps us to go in and find the true master within. Who was always the true master within. The human being who came into our life and pushed us back to truth and reality inside dies like us, like anybody else. Finishes. The master never finishes. By that time we have found the master was within. That was an experience to bring us to the true master. I once asked the great master that once you see the reality inside, do you still feel like seeing the reality outside? If you found the master inside, do you still need the master outside? He says you don't need, he told me, you don't need the master outside, but you love him even more. You can't help looking for him again just because you love him so much. You love him for the way he came into your life. You love him for the way he took you to reality. You love him for the way he stood by you at all times. You love him because he becomes part of you inside. There's no way you can forget such a person. And therefore, although one can close one's eyes and talk to the master within, one can see the master within, one likes to open the eyes and say, where are you going there? That great actor who pretended to be an ordinary human being, where are you? He loved to play those games with the outside master also. He explained truthfully that the external form is the most important catalyst in the process of self-realization. And I was surprised to find after traveling around the world again and again, maybe 50, 60 times in most of the countries of the world, I have not come across a single seeker who could claim to have crossed the threshold of his own mind without the help of a perfect living master or a living master, to say the least. How much are we tied down to the flow of attention outward into a world of phenomena, which has become reality for us, there's no way for us to get back to our own self with our own efforts. In this short workshop, I've taken a lot of your time to give you the introduction. I want you to experience the phenomenon of going within. Touching your own self, and you will be surprised to find that what you thought was a master, perfect living master outside was in fact inside. To have that experience personally, to your satisfaction, this short workshop has been called. The purpose of this workshop is to correct the direction of our attention. If you want to be a real seeker, don't go in the wrong direction. Go in the right direction. Whether you go slow or fast depends upon how much bondage you have with the so-called reality of this world. How much karma you have created. How many attachments you have created. Your own strings will have to be cut one by one. It may take time. It may not take time. But if the direction is right, gradually, experience after experience, you will find the truth within. You will also find the truth about the perfect living master. Therefore, be prepared to enter the living temple which you carry with you at all times. Now, this is not a particular kind of meditation. There is no ritual involved at all. I want to make this very plain. I am not espousing any particular religion, any particular cult, any particular spiritual system, any particular discipline. All I am espousing is simply go within. Don't fitter and waste your energy and your attention in the outside world. Have a look at what is inside you. That's all I am saying. You can call it by any label, any name. And incidentally, I might tell you, that all the labels of the world will fit in with this. They all said so. 
surprisingly, all the religions, all the societies, all the cults, all the people are talking of going within. So you don't have to change your religion, you don't have to change your society, you don't have to change your master, you don't have to change anything. The only thing you have to change is the direction of your attention. Instead of letting the entire attention flow out to this world, keep it inside. Not forever, for a while. Try it at least for the workshop. Try for a few minutes. Try to hold your attention within and see who you are. You always know who other people are. Here is the story, a strange story of, of a resident. A resident means one who resides. Dictionary meaning. A resident of a beautiful place called the Third Eye Center. Why do we call it Third Eye Center? Because these two eyes can only look outward. I have never seen these two eyes looking inward. These two eyes are not constructed, not structured to look inside. The retina is behind, the lens is in front, the lights fall on objects that are conveyed, inverted image is caused on the retina, the retina through the optic nerve carries the message and you see outside. That's how these eyes work. But we know that when these eyes see that there is somebody using the eyes, have you ever noticed this? That when you are you close these eyes, open these eyes, you see something outside, there's somebody using the, these eyes and that somebody is only one, not two. There are two beings sitting in the pupil of the eye looking out. There's only one being using these eyes. Like this, that one being is not behind each eye. The one being is in the middle. You can close your eyes and see where it is. You can feel where you are seeing from. The seeing is different from the eyes. That you are seeing from a location, single location behind the eyes. Forget these eyes. Close these eyes. Imagine something else. Imagine you are seeing a cloud. Imagine you are seeing a plane flying right now. You are still seeing and not with these eyes, but from the same spot that you are seeing with these eyes. The spot behind these eyes. If these fingertips represent these physical eyes, you know you are seeing from this confluence, this joining point. This is the location right in the head. You can feel it yourself. That center behind the eyes where consciousness resides is called the third eye center, our residence. In the wakeful physical body, that is our residence. We normally reside there. And what do we do? We never visit our residence. We go and visit everybody else's residence. We are constantly visiting, constantly calling on other people, constantly calling on everybody except visiting our own residence. My suggestion is, let's look at our own residence and see where do we reside? Behind the eyes, in the head, in this body. Where consciousness is emanating from, where attention is flowing out from, not to, from. Origin of consciousness. I want you to have an experience of going back behind the eyes to the place from where you are watching. You have been watching all these years. That is the purpose of this exercise. In order to do it successfully, and taking a cue from the masters who have done it very successfully, it is good to put your body, this physical body, in a comfortable position. If you make it very uncomfortable, like Ed said, you do a headstand upside down, then the tension of that posture can take your attention into the posture and not behind the eyes. If you make your if you take on a very un, unusual artificial posture, like crossing your legs and pulling them from behind, which many yoga, yogis do, and you are not used to doing it, you will notice during your meditation session, your attention is not behind the eyes, but in the toes and the fingers which are paining and aching. Your attention can go into the knees, into the ankles. That's not the purpose. You should be comfortable so that your attention can be where it is supposed to be in the wakeful state, behind the eyes, straight behind the eyes, at the third eye center. That is the third eye center. It is totally frivolous to think that you can dig a hole in the skull and find another center sitting there which you call the third eye center. I was astonished to see a book written, a book written quoting the Dalai Lama, the Buddhist God, the Buddhist incarnation in human form of God, quoting the Dalai Lama as saying, 
that yes, the third eye center is a physical center and you have to dr drill a hole in the skull and reach it and then you tickle it with a little rod and you get enlightenment. Such things have been published and read seriously by people. And I was with the Dalai Lama when we, the book first came and he was shocked. But like many enlightened people, he laughed. He said, see what stories people can make. Just to go into the press, to go into media, you can make any interesting story. The third eye center is not a physical center. It's a center of consciousness. It's a center where you feel you are. As a being, where do you feel you are? Wherever you feel you are as a being, conscious being, not as a body. That is the third eye center. And that happens to be behind the eyes in the wakeful state. So make your body comfortable. Treat it like a mansion. Treat it like a temple. Now we are entering the temple. The temple has many layers, many levels. We want to enter at the wakeful level. The wakeful level of this temple, the living temple, happens to be at the sixth floor. So you might take an elevator. Why is it the sixth floor? Because you are awake. If you are not awake, then I would suggest some other floor to enter the temple. Because the temple has many energy levels. And those energy levels almost create separate floors and separate experiences. They start from the bottom and they go on one, two, three, four, five, six. In this body, you can experience by lowering your attention to these levels and holding it there, you have different levels of consciousness and experience based mostly on the word we use, energy. You heard of the word energy? There's a flow of energy. All the energies in the human consciousness flow through these six levels. And we call them the six chakras. These six chakras are nothing but the staging points for the flow of energy in the human body. Depending upon our level of consciousness and our depth of sleep in the physical body, we reach and access these levels. Some people say, oh, I found a yogi. He was so great. He taught me how to go to the heart center. I said, boy, aren't you lucky? We all do it every night when we go to sleep. We all go to the heart center. Where else can we go? He said, another person said, there's a center here in the throat called the Shakti center, the center, the center of power. Shakti, represented by women, goddesses. In the Indian mythology, the Shakti is represented by the goddess. And where does it locate itself in the chakras? At the fifth chakra, at the Kant chakra, the throat chakra. And the throat, the Shakti is hidden here. And the person said, that was great yogi I found. He taught me how I can descend right up to the Shakti chakra. I said, boy, you are great. We all do it every night when we go to sleep. Every one of us, you can test it out. Every time you go to sleep and go and become drowsy and have your center starts descending. You are in dreaming, you are in the Kant Chakra automatically. There's nothing new. But we are fooled by these people because they think we don't know what sleep is and what the center of consciousness is, how it shifts. But when we are in the wakeful state, physically wakeful state as we are now, we are behind the eyes. Sixth center. The great master used to say, if you are already in the sixth floor in a building and you want to go up, you never take, press the button for ground and then come up again. That's a waste of time. You should start from sixth and go up. Right now we are already awake and alert at the sixth center. We are already awake in the wakeful state. We don't have to go into a trance. We don't have to go into induced sleep at the lower levels of the chakras in order to come back again to the sixth center and say, ah, I found myself awake. You are awake now. Start from here. You have enough discrimination of the wakeful person in the sixth center now to cut all that crap and start from here and go up. <laughs> Sufficient discrimination exists even at this time. So I am suggesting to you, when you enter the living temple, enter at the sixth floor. There are many ways of doing it. Your attention is scattered. Close your eyes. Just pull it right behind the eyes. There's another way. If you are so scattered in your body, you don't know where you are, pull up from wherever you are, gradually take an elevator along the spine and come up and land behind the eyes and jump off. Whatever you do, you must experience being behind the eyes in order to know that you are at the third eye center. If you don't experience that, if you experience you are in the body sitting on a chair trying to figure out what is this stuff going on, and you will experience nothing because your attention is still scattered. 
in order for you to experience being at the third eye center, your attention should be withdrawn and you should feel you are actually in the head, that the body is really a building, a temple, that you are really, you can float inside as consciousness wherever you like, that you decided to float and stay in a platform built just at this level. And I would suggest to you, build a strong platform. I am suggesting it from past experience. Most people who don't build a platform, keep it very airy and keep it like a cloud here. When they start meditation, they are down in the throat and dreaming before they know it. You will find that you have had sounder sleep during some of these meditation sessions than ever before. Because the tendency of attention to drop to the sleep state is very strong, especially when you are trying to pull back to the third eye center. In order to remain awake and have the experience of the third eye center, to experience yourself in the next best state than the physical, to experience that, you must remain awake. You should be more awake, not less awake, when you pull yourself behind the center. It does not mean that your consciousness of the body will remain the same. You may become totally unconscious of the body, but you will be fully conscious of yourself. You'll be more awake, not less. And that's the test if you are really at the third eye center. Try to stay there as best as you can. Use any means. Some of the means I can suggest are, one, imagine, imagination. Imagine you are there. If you imagine you are there, the process of imagining you are there pulls the attention there. And ultimately, you are there. It's a good process. Imagination. Second is visualization. Visualize you are talking to somebody from there. The somebody you are talking to will be in front of you. Therefore, if you talk from there to somebody whom you are visualizing, contemplating the face of dhyan, as we call it, dhyan or the contemplation of a face you are talking to, you are addressing, you are looking at, that will put you back in the third eye center because that is where you contemplate from. The next suggestion is repeat some words. Just keep on repeating because when you repeat the words, your attention goes into the repeating of the words. After you start repeating, start listening to what you are repeating. If you start listening to what you are repeating, your attention goes back to the point from where you are listening, which is the third eye center. Next suggestion is, if you hear any sound, sound of the bell or any other sound, listen to that sound carefully. Because if you listen to it carefully, the sound is coming from you, you get drawn to the third eye center. It's not difficult. You can follow any of these methods. They are all designed for the single purpose of putting you back in the center which is the starting point of the spiritual journey. The different regions of wakefulness, all the different regions of reality that we have ever heard of, exist within and the starting point for that experience is a third eye center. It's like the airport. You have to reach the airport to board your flight. It is like the railroad station. You have to reach the railroad station to board your train. Like that, you have to be at the third eye center before you make any spiritual journey. If you are scattered outside and keep on talking of a journey, it is all wild goose chase, as they call it in English. Wild goose chase. You are getting nothing in hand. But if you are concentrated at the third eye center, you will have access to the train, to the flight in the form of the sound. Hold on to it. Hold on to that sound current. Hold on to the sound vibrating inside. Hold on to it. It will awaken you from stage to stage right up to the true creator. It's all inside. But first, let's get on to the airport. Let's get on to the starting station. Be comfortable enough in your body not to give your attention to the aches and pains and don't be so comfortable and don't relax so much that you go to sleep easily. All the yogic asanas that were prescribed by the yogis, one yogi prescribed 84 asanas. He said there are 84 positions that you can take. He published a book in India that there are 84 <coughs> positions you can take, postures you can adopt of the asanas. If you adopt them, they are conducive to meditation. Somebody said, that's not enough for me. He prescribed 84,000 in another book. People bought the one with 84,000 more. There's more knowledge in it. But they forgot the whole purpose of that was to put your body in a position where you are comfortable enough not to let your attention be distracted by the pain and you are uncomfortable enough not to go to sleep. And each one of you can find your own right point, right posture for that purpose. This part of the exercise 
where you only have to imagine you are behind the eyes, has no relationship with the lights, with the distractions. These can pull you away, but for once you can feel you are there. So there should be no difficulty once experiencing this is where it is, to know where the center is. Even if you hear and feel, you have to hear and feel from the center. This exercise was to designed to hold your attention and consciousness at the wakeful conscious center from where we he hear, see, feel, get distracted, everything happens from there. Idea is to know that. At this time, we don't even know that. We are scattered. This concentrates our attention gradually to that point. So the other things are happening and we can say, I can hear a, I can hear a sound, but I'm hearing from here. If I hear a sound and go with it, I move away from the center. If I stay there and hear the distraction from there, I'm still at the center. If there's a light shining and distracting me for meditation, yeah, it is a distraction for meditation. But to know I am at the center and the light is distracting me in front or on the side, you are still at the center. Any other question? Yes. It seems like we were seeing images and things going by. You would see an image and then it would be like kind of a burden of light or something. And then the moment I focus on it, I lose it. You're not supposed to focus. Let them go. Let them go. Do you hear me? Let them pass. <laughs> when these images come in front, if you focus on them, you are no longer in the center. You run with them. Stay back in the center. Let the images move and run away. You will notice that the images will take a direction eventually. If you just sit focusing on being there, not focusing on seeing something, you're focusing on being there, what you are seeing is happening like a TV screen. Things move on the TV screen, a car is running fast and goes. The car runs, you don't run. Just watch. In the same way, you should sit comfortably, relaxed in the same place behind the eyes. And things may come, forms and faces come, and they keep going. Let them go. New ones will come. New lights will sparkle up. Stars may shine here and there. A streak of light comes from one side, comes, floats around like a blob and goes away. Let all this happen and go. These will happen naturally in the process of concentrating attention. But stay in the center. Right? Yes. See the picture darkly. In other words, you see images and you see undifferentiated lights. You see lots of activity. You hear things. And uh, sometimes an image gains a fair amount of resolution. But what I was wondering today is, if you're succeeding in your meditation, does the image get clearer and clearer and so on? It's like a brilliant dream that you're in your... No. If the image becomes clearer and clearer, it only means your ability to put concentrated attention on the image is improving. It does not increase your presence at the third eye center. It increases your presence in the image. The image becomes clear. What should become clear is your awareness that you are there. Well, I noticed that when I first started out, I was I was summoning myself. And then I remembered you're enjoying us not to follow the voice because the voice is not what it is. Right. And then in terms of trying to imagine here, like that one time you talked about sitting in a chair and all this kind of thing, uh, it would be helpful to try to use an image sort of like you're waiting for an eye to open, or is there supposed to be images, or do you just sort of go into a space that is so unique you know you're there finally? Don't anticipate anything. Why anticipate it'll be an eye opening or it'll be an image? Don't anticipate anything. Be free to see what happens. Don't anticipate and thereby focus your attention on that anticipation. When you anticipate an eye will open, after a while you'll see an eye opening, <laughs> which will be an image of an eye in front of you. And that is not you. That is the anticipated image you created and then began to concentrate your attention on focusing on when that happens. So it will happen. But that's not the center. The center is unconcerned what is happening. Say to yourself, I am here. I know where I am. I can feel my head. I am still conscious of my body. I can feel my head. I am in the center. I know where my ears are without touching them. If you don't know where the ears are, you can touch them with your hands. After touching them with your hands, you'll say, ah, now I know where I am. 
I know where my eyes are. I can put my hand. I know where the top of my head is. Having experienced this feeling with your hands and knowing you are in the center of the head, concentrate on being there and leave the images unpredicted. Whatever comes, comes and goes, and it tries to pull you because of its interest. Push back. Never try to see. I get the sensation like I'm looking for something. Oh, wait a minute, no, that, that's another abstraction. Exa exactly. When you start by looking for something, you can never be at the third eye center. You should start not for, not for looking, but use looking in an abstract sense. You are looking for where you are, not looking for something that you can see, but looking to find out where you are. Now, that's a different meaning of the word looking. Look for, look for where you are. It's like finding where you are. Try to find where you are rather than look for something in front of you. Yeah, but I mean, there's that strange quality where as you sort of come to center, suddenly you're sort of like sitting there in this darkness, as you say, and you're sort of like aware of your center. Yeah. And, but you still get the sensation like you're waiting for something. Yeah, you are waiting for something, but you can wait for something. Get the sensation of waiting for something, hold on to that sensation of waiting for something. And what comes and goes, let it come and go. Keep waiting. You'll still be at the center. The point is to keep your attention on the self, not on the experience of the self. You will have a lot of things to see, more than you can imagine. But you don't look for them. If you look for them, you don't see all the things that you are going to see. Well, the, the concept of the witness. Uh, when you divide yourself, you're, you're sort of like waiting to see something. And then you say, well, wait a minute, the witness doesn't make a comment, right? I mean, the witness... And some witnesses are very babbling, they keep on... Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Somebody can sit there and keep on saying, now what's going on? Now what's happening? What's that there? The you can keep you, on saying that, doesn't matter. The way you express witness, though, that is a non-commenting awareness. It's and a pure listening post. A real witness is a pure listening post, listens to whatever is happening. And there's no sense of you at that time that that's happening? No sense of you, as, as you know it in the physical body. Try again. Don't move from that center of the witness, witness box. Stay in the witness box. Don't run after the others. Just stay like you are in the center. All that you have to do, looking, seeing, babbling, talking, commenting, should be done from there. Then you are fine. It's not the babbling that bothers. It's not the looking that matters. It is when you look and concentrate, the attention flows to what you're looking at. And you don't stay in the center. Conscious of where you are, you can look at whatever comes and goes. Don't move from that witness box. Well, in the language, basically, they always say that when you meditate, then suddenly something comes. Yeah. It will come. And then you will know that this is, that what come now you want to pay attention to and not let go, or what? Yeah, when such a thing happens, you tell me. It should be it should be a strong enough experience. <laughs> it should be a worthwhile experience mm -hmm. to give your attention to. These little, little images coming, getting stronger, brighter, are not worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Wait for the worthwhile thing to look at, then give attention. Okay? Any other question? Yes. Uh, years ago, I just started <coughs> meditation, and they said, you know, just keep playing the mantra over and over it depends on the purpose. Why, uh, why are you doing it? The answer to your question will depend upon why you want to do it. Supposing you want to experience peace and tranquility, then don't bother where you are. Just keep on repeating the mantra rapidly and sink into it and you'll feel refreshed. If you're trying to find out who you are, that process won't give you any answer. It all depends on the purpose. If you want to know who you are, what's the truth about this body? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? You have to be awake at the third eye center. The energy is going back to trying to... To wakefulness, yes. You will have a little harder time than most others because of the previous practice. The previous practice will naturally draw you to a state which is called transcendental. Actually, it is a relaxing technique to take it down. 
It takes you down to the heart center eventually. That's a relax, uh, technique of relaxation. And if you want relaxation and tranquility, it works. But if you want to find answers to questions, like many of us curious fellows here want to do, you want to know what's the truth, then you have to build, build a very strong floor to keep awake and not let it go down. And the mantra has to be used only to stay here, not for the purpose of relaxing. There's a different purpose. Okay. Is any more questions on what we are doing so far? When, when, uh, when, I, when I'm doing, following the instructions and going through the meditation, and a couple times I like to say almost fall, fall asleep, but then I heard your voice say, come back, and that's because I'm sleeping. But... <laughs> you're sleeping, you wouldn't hear me. You are getting, going to sleep. Yeah, I catch you in good time. Yeah, you caught okay. me in good time. <laughs> but generally, each time I come to the third center, it's a jolt. I yeah. mean, I'm just there. Yeah. It's not a gradual thing. All of a sudden, I'm just there. Right. Like, it almost jolts me. Yeah, it is a jolt. Is, is that how it's supposed to be? Exactly. You are jolted into awareness. Actually, you're not moving anywhere. No. I might remind people here that when we say go to the third eye center, you don't have to go anywhere. You're already there. You are jolted into awareness where you are. It's not going anywhere. It's not even moving or concentrating. It's getting the awareness of where you are. You're already there, but lost awareness. But it's never gradual when I get there. It's no. not like I'm just gradually getting there. No. When I finally get to that, where I know where I am, it is an actual jolt. It's always a jolt. When you get there and find where it is, it's a jolt. Okay? Uh, any more questions? Yes. Do you think it's equivalent to the fact that we're trying all the time to catch that witness inside that spectator? Can no. you put this no. idea that no. I no. want to see that witness? No, because when you say, I want to see the witness, the I that is saying so is the witness. By trying to catch a witness, you will never catch yourself. You will always remain separate from the witness. Similarly, when somebody says, I can imagine, visualize myself sitting. I can see my form sitting there in the third eye center. They are sitting, squatting or sitting on a chair. That little form you are seeing, that is not yourself. Then who is yourself? The one who is seeing that form. What should be at the third eye center is the one who looks at that form. The one who creates a witness. The one who wants to say, I want to have a witness created. Who wants to create the witness? The self. The self should be the witness not another separated being. You don't have to create any separate entity, a separate being behind the eyes to experience being at the third eye center. It must be your own self. No image, no separate being, no separate form, no separate higher self, no separate deep self, nothing of the sort. There's only one self. There never was two. There never have been two selves. Nobody has ever experienced a state where one's lower self could talk to a higher self. It has never happened. By the time you got to that state, you were the higher self. There's no such thing as saying, I am going to not talk to God. By the time you can talk to God, you are God. The truth is, self has never been split. That's the whole secret. That's what we are trying to find out. The self cannot be split. It is one. Has always remained one. And is now one. The rest is illusion, the creation of that self. What I am suggesting is, the self should discover its location behind the eyes. No second. No second to create. That's not an aid. It makes a separation, a difference. It creates a distance. Figure out if you are the only self, where are you? If you are the only self, there is no other self, where are you? Just figure that out. Don't even try to find a spot. Try to, no, you, this for you, not for everybody. Don't try to copy this. For you. Don't try to imagine you are at a third eye center. Close your eyes and figure out, where am I? No second. I am only one. Where am I? Where am I asking this question from? Where am I talking? Where am I looking from? Where am I? Am I at any place? Where am I? I want to know where I am. Get to this quest inside. Where am I? And find out where you find. That is the third I sent. Okay? Try next time. Okay, we'll have a break for lunch. And we'll continue the next exercise, the next session, immediately after lunch. In the lunch time, you can think out any questions. I'll start the session by answering any questions unanswered questions and then we get down to business. The business of finding out our own self. Looks strange, but that's the most important business of life.
the most important job we can have as a human being is to find out our own self. 